Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. Join us each day for the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Earlier today, shareholders in Tesla voted in favor of CEO Elon Musk's compensation package. They also voted to move the company's state of incorporation to Texas from Delaware. However, the pay vote is only advisory, and it doesn't guarantee Musk will get his package worth right now, marked to market at around $48.4 billion. You know, back in January, a judge in Delaware nullified that compensation plan. Tesla, to be fair, is expected to appeal. And if the appeal fails, moving Tesla's legal home to Texas, that would allow the board to revive the pay package in a new state, potentially with more favorable courts. Brian? Well, joining us is Dana Hall, Bloomberg News senior technology reporter, to shed some further light on this. Um, So we don't know the actual margin of the win, but we did have that post on X from Elon Musk saying that, Uh, that they were passing by a wide margin. What have we heard from investors on both sides? Yeah, so, you know, the voting has been going on for quite a while, and you saw uh, Tesla do a very big outreach campaign to retail investors, and the big wild card was how are the large shareholders going to vote. We still don't know the margin of victory, but it was obviously pretty big. I mean, Elon Musk was very happy at the shareholder meeting today. When he came onto stage, he did like a little dance, and he said, I, you know, I, hot damn, I love you guys, or something like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was, he was in a very expansive mood. I haven't heard much reaction from shareholders so far today. I mean, obviously, some of, some of the larger funds like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and CalPERS, you know, they put out statements ahead of the vote saying that they were planning to vote against the pay package. Um, but, you know, the people that were for it were for it. And um, this is, you know, this this is a good outcome for Musk, and it's a strong outcome for Tesla as they still kind of wrestle with the Delaware decision. So, Dan, as I understand it, back in 2018, uh, he worked out a deal with the board making him eligible for these stock options if he was able to get Tesla to hit certain milestones. He was successful in that. But in January, a judge in Delaware nullified the plan. What was the basis for that ruling? Can you remind us? Yeah, I mean, so a shareholder sued Musk. Uh, The case is called Tornetta versus Musk and uh, argued that the board was rife with conflicts of interest and that, you know, it wasn't really a fair negotiation. I mean, that Musk was basically pressuring the board to give him this package and that there was just a lot of problems with the way that the package was disclosed. And so the judge kind of came out with this 200 page ruling that really shocked everybody um, back in January and really infuriated Musk. He immediately talked about, you know, it's time to leave Delaware as our corporate home. And so this shareholder meeting was like a reaction to that. Like, we're going to revote on the pay package and, and, and move to Texas. And, you know, the, I think that Tesla's hope is that by re-ratifying the same pay package from 2018, that they are answering a lot of the concerns that the judge had. They're saying, look, investors are still for this plan. They fully know what they're getting into. We have a lot more disclosures. Our proxy statement even links to your 200-page opinion. So it's their effort to kind of answer her concerns. This really is a very interesting uh, stretch from 2018 till now. I mean, if you ask a lot of people, the narrative on Tesla stock is, well, it's down more than 50 percent. You know, it was up over $400 at one point. Now it's at 182. Uh, but they forget that back in 2018, when he signed on to this package, and it was approved by 73 percent of the vote, the stock was on a split adjusted basis at around $24. And now at 182, that's a massive, that's a massive move. So this is really kind of like pure capitalism at work, right? Oh, yeah, 100 percent. I mean, you, you know, you can look at the pay package and say Elon Musk did what the uh, comp plan kind of asked him to do. He met these crazy, big, very ambitious, very aggressive targets. He deserves to be paid. And, you know, not only did he enrich himself, but he enriched legions of shareholders, both big and small, and that it's crazy not to reward him for for doing that. On the flip side, 
the intention of the 2018 pay package was to incentivize Musk to stay focused on Tesla. Mm. And even though he did meet all the milestones, he then sold t- his Tesla shares to buy Twitter, which he renamed X. And he has started yet another X. A- yet another company known as X.AI. So he's still very interested in many, many, many other things. And so what I'm most curious about is, you know, beyond the legal wrangling around this current paid package, like at what point does the Tesla board come back and like potentially incentivize him again? Like, Mm. is he going to get a new pay package going (laughs) forward? Let's talk about the approval of Musk's move, um, moving the headquarters from uh, Texas or to Texas, I should say, from Delaware. Is this all about the strategy to try to get uh, the pay package, the ruling on the pay package overturned? Or is there something um, that we have to understand about his thinking and the way he views doing business in Delaware versus Texas? Yeah, I mean, so Tesla's corporate headquarters is already in Texas. Uh, That move happened uh, in late 2021. And you know, Musk lives in Texas. A lot of executives are now based there. They have a big workforce there. And I think that, you know, Musk's frustration with Delaware Chancery Court, which kind of came to a head over, you know, not just the the long trial over his compensation plan, but also the trial over uh, Tesla's acquisition of Solar City. Like, he just is done. He would rather be in Texas, which I think has you know, a very much newer, you know, I mean, corporate law is not as well established in Texas, but I think that, you know, he's, Musk is just ready to kind of have everything be in the same state. And yeah, going forward, any litigation that he would face would not be subject to Delaware Chancery Court. That's why in the past, like, 24 hours, you've seen a lot of lawsuits filed in Delaware court because Tesla could announce that they've successfully you know, kind of move their legal jurisdiction to Texas like any day now. I mean, it, it could be it could happen very fast once there's a legal filing. Dana, we had a pop in the stock today, but I'm curious about those who wanted to vote against this and big, huge uh, and pension funds like CalSTRS and, and CalPERS. Uh, is there any thinking or were there any threats from them that they might, you know, divest to a certain degree? No, I mean, that that is certainly one avenue. I mean, you have to sort of ask yourself if you're that unhappy with the company, like, why are you still an investor? Um, but I think that some investors, you know, would feel like shareholder activism is the way to go. And they try to try to engage with the company internally. And uh, obviously, you know, Musk and board chair Robin Denholm had a lot of meetings with big uh, institutional investors over the past couple of weeks. Um, I have not heard anything from any of the funds that said that they were no on pay about uh, divestment. Could there be f- more lawsuits, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, always. I mean, someone could sue to stop the move to Texas once they're in Texas. Like, I mean, yeah, there, 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 there's always a lot of litigation around things like this. I'm kind of curious about this, too. Uh, I know it's counterfactual or speculation or whatever, but what might Elon Musk have done if he lost this vote? I think he would have been upset. It would have been kind of like a stinging rebuke uh, of both the legal strategy and of his tenure as the CEO. But, you know, um, I mean, he would have he would have probably continued. I mean, I don't think it would have changed. You know, it would have it wouldn't have changed. You know, I don't know if he would. Have, I don't think he would have quit necessarily. I mean, he still owns 13 percent of the company. Very quickly, last question, this new stock exchange that may be established in Dallas, do you think he uh, will list Tesla and uh, some of his other companies on that exchange? Yeah, that I do not know. I mean, I would I would imagine that the exchange would have to get up and running for, for a bit first. All right, we'll leave it there. Brian? Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, Dan, what's the workout coming on this program? We'll get questions from all over the place. Uh, uh, but uh, good questions and good answers. Donna, thank you very much. Dana Holt, Bloomberg News Senior Technology Reporter. We wanted to take a closer look at markets, and we're joined by Willem Sells, a global CIO at HSBC Global Private Banking and Wealth with us here in our studios in Hong Kong. Willem, thanks very much for coming in. 
So we are starting to kind of get into the area again about worrying about um, growth scares. Uh, we had um, imp- uh, jobless claims have another bounce uh, in the U.S. And we've seen a little bit of a softening of the data. Uh, is it rational to be worried about growth here or should we just include it in, let's say, uh, uh, a group of scenarios that are possible and that should be discounted? Well, in our discussion with our clients, I, it, it's it's remarkable that um, you know uh, in, in the past six months there is a complete swing. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, the, they were asking about the risk of uh, a recession six twelve months ago. This is no longer the case, and I agree with them, and I agree with Yellen on this as well. Um, you know, data are slowing a little bit, but from a very strong position. Um, you know, so uh, that basically means that um, you know it gives the Fed the opportunity to 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 cut in September in our view. So I, th- I think this is actually a good thing that we are uh, coming from that very strong to a, a milder economic growth. And in the rest of the world, we're actually seeing a slight acceleration. So we're broadening out our exposure, um, adding uh, Europe and Asia to uh, the US, but continuing also to be comfortable with US stocks. So Velma, you do believe that US rates then are restrictive right now, and it would be a prudent thing for the Fed to begin cutting ASAP, I would imagine, right? So, we, yeah, so, so um, indeed, cutting in September, even if they cut in September, obviously, those rates will remain restricted. The real rate is at a very elevated level, and it has been on that plateau for quite a long time. Um, you know, they have excluded uh, more or less uh, rate hikes. The dots did not include anybody who was looking for a rate hike. So that's a good um, signal. And obviously, that also allows people to go into bonds. So one of the biggest flows that we are seeing is people locking in those bond yields with that, um, you know, comforting message from the Fed. Do you see it as a possibility, though, that if growth does slow, maybe not all the way to recession, but if it does slow measurably, uh, that that could actually lead to a further big bounce in the mega caps? So, uh, to the extent that indeed those are growth uh, style stocks, um, you know, which are interest rate sensitive, indeed that could, um, you know, help the the, the, the growth style, um, you know, companies. Um, you know, our strategy for the moment is actually to broaden it out, not to give up on the Max Seven because their earnings growth is solid. Um, but when you look at the earnings momentum um, over the next number of quarters, where the acceleration is in earnings growth is in other sectors. Um, those obviously are cheaper as well. So we broaden out our exposure in the equity market, both from a geographical perspective, but also within the U.S. across other sectors. So, for example, industrials and financials. I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you, thinking about maybe a slower growth in the U.S., we know that uh, growth in Europe has been weak for some time. Uh, the ECB is now leaning into that by uh, delivering a bit of accommodation. Lagarde, yes, uh, putting some caveats in as she cuts interest rates. You know, data dependency, we get that. But I'm wondering whether or not growth in Europe Europe may pick up at a rate that at some point could rival, at least rival, what we're seeing in the U.S. Is that misguided? Uh, it's picking up. We are coming out of, of recession. Uh, we have come out of recession. And so that is, um, you know, giving that momentum. And that's, I think, the opportunity or the excuse, if you want to call it that, um, for people to, um, you know, start to think about, uh, you know, that that very big valuation differential between the US and, and Europe. And that, uh, you know, can be unlocked by that cyclical momentum. Indeed, when you look at the growth forecast, but that's more sort of for 2025, the growth rates, um, you know, for Europe, the UK and the US shouldn't be too far apart. Um, where, whereas obviously for 2024, the US is, is, is much much superior. But indeed, you can, could have that narrowing of that gap. So I'm, I'm personally of the view that we are going to get a little bit of a growth scare here. People are going to be concerned about it, uh, whether or not it leads to recession. You know, that's way down the road. Um, but then I note in your overweights, uh, the US and Japan, I think everybody can understand that. But emerging market Asia... Now, if we get a U.S. slowdown, what happens to emerging market Asia? Well, emerging market Asia, for us, um, you know, there are, there, well, within Asia, there are three countries that we're overweight. It's Japan, it's India, and it's South Korea. So, you know, India, we do think, um, you know, that people shouldn't exaggerate, um, you know, the election news. I do think that you can conti- get continued, um, you know, reforms, especially on the subject of, um, you know, technology and um, advanced manufacturing. Obviously, there is, you know, very, um, you know, positive uh, longer-term growth 
outlook, outlook in India as well. So I think that market will rebound. And so we want to be there. South Korea is more because of the semiconductor, um, you know, p- pick up as well. Um, so we are selective within the region, but we're actively diversifying as we are still neutral on mainland China and Hong Kong, um, because we don't think that the rally that you've seen a, a number of weeks ago will extend uh, as long as you don't have an acceleration in economic growth or in, in earnings. So we're doing that active diversification, being selective. But yes, because of India and South Korea uh, and then Japan, we have the overweight here as well. What would it take for you to change your mind on China? And are you prepared to do that in the event that the government comes to some type of realization that more stimulus is required? Are you able to pivot quickly and maybe to to rethink your view on China? Sure. We, I mean, we reconsider it every month at least um, uh, in our in our investment committees. Um, but what we really need is that um, you know that earnings acceleration and the GDP acceleration. You know, certainly foreigners would be looking for that. Um, won't have necessarily um, you know be, won't won't necessarily be scared of missing the first five or ten percent of the rally. They want to wait and see to see the evidence in the hard data. Um, you know, so that's what they're they're waiting for. The Q one earnings results of uh, from uh, from China were somewhat disappointing I think um, you know here um, in, in, and in China as well the um, the property package was probably a little bit lower than what the market was expecting so um, you know people not uh, you know jumping to conclusions or um, you know giving the market the benefit of the doubt they want to see the numbers but then indeed there are there there, there, there would be inflows once you see that because obviously that market is extremely cheap people are extremely underweight um, you know so then, indeed, we would need to act. So we've seen, obviously, a lot of growth in uh, AI-related uh, stock buying uh, in the United States in particular. So I think that's one of the most important um, trends running through the market. People are very concerned about, you know, when does it break? When does it slow down? What do you look at to, to learn that? I mean, what's the key for that? Yeah. So, so, so what we think is, you know, so again, this is one of the objectives of broadening, right? And so that people are not only just investing in the Max Seven and in that trade, um, you know, because even though we are positive on that, and um, you know, the IMF uh, thinks that we're going to have up to zero point eight percent boost to global GDP in the medium term because of that, which is you know very considerable, um, you know, it's just wise to spread out, um, you know, especially as that um, uh, as that valuation differential gives you opportunities elsewhere. But there are related trades that one can do. Even utilities, for example, have yeah. been boosted by that yeah. energy demand that will yeah, be linked absolutely. to that. Yeah, it's, it's really quite a, an interesting phenomenon that we've seen that. Um, all right, Willem, thanks very much for joining us and for coming into our studios with us. Always a pleasure. Willem Sells, Global CIO at HSBC, Global Private Banking and Wealth. Bank of Japan is holding a two-day meeting. It will wrap up that meeting later this morning. Joining us now for some discussion is Taro Kimura, Senior Japan Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Taro, thank you for joining us. Bloomberg Economics is saying this will be a consequential meeting. Might we see a reduction in bond buying? Right. I think it's really uh, likely that the BOJ will um, announce the cutting its uh, JGB purchases, which is kind of a, a very momen- uh, momentous uh, pivot from its um, unconventional monetary policy, particularly after it's introduced, it, it, it introduced quantitative qualitative uh, easing back in 2013. Um, that said, um, I don't think the announcement won't um, spook the, the bond market because I expect the BOJ um, to announce very um, gradual and modest reduction to JGB yields uh, based on the Governor Ueda's uh, previous comment that he doesn't want to use um, bond buyings as active policy tool. So basically, he, I think he doesn't want to spook the market by QTs, but um, it's a, uh, another big step for the BOJ's uh, normalization to its policy. You no doubt about that. And I'm looking on the Bloomberg terminal. I guess the yield right now on the 10-year JGB is just around 95 basis points. I would imagine that the the banks in Japan are celebrating this type of action, that the BOJ is finally moving to uh, widen the spread a, a little bit between the policy rate and, and you know, let's say a 10-year yield, right? Right, absolutely. So one one of the backdrop I expect the BOJ will um, uh, do, do the cut in JGB purchases as, as soon as this meeting is, um, basically the, the, the market's 
doesn't want the BOJ intervene um, to longer is anymore. Uh, so absolutely, it will welcome. And the banks and fin- financial institutions won't hire JGBEOs that push back the BOJ's uh, QT process, um, uh, uh, m- make it um, um, comfortable for, for, for the central bank. I note from a few comments, uh, there are some fears that the BOJ still drags its feet a little and doesn't make a move uh, on either interest rates or on uh, the bond buying. And I'm wondering if they, if that's the case, if that's what happens, uh, could the yen breach the 160 level to the weak side? Uh, I I, th- I think so. Uh, if the BOJ, which isn't my baseline, uh, and I don't think it will happen, but if the BOJ hold policy on e- uh, both on rates and um, JGB purchases, um, it's gonna like you know. I think it's a it's a good opportunity for yen bears to seize on the opportunity to add more selling pressure to the yen, and probably it will break uh, 160 again. Um, that said, I, I think the the view from that the Bank of Japan may hold off is coming from the fact that the Japan's uh, Japan's economy isn't that strong under the status quo. But um, my view is um, the BOJ is moving uh, forward-looking uh, with this forward-looking assessment that um, the higher wage growth agreed by annual spring wage negotiation will feed into stronger service prices. So that's why I, I think um, it's July hike and um, today's uh, QT announcement is um, already in the pipeline. So what do we need to know? What do we need to understand about the inflation story in Japan? You were talking a moment ago about a weak yen, and that tends to import inflationary pressures into an economy. Uh, you mentioned the wage negotiations, too. So we're seeing, uh, finally, uh, after seeming decades-long stagnation in wages, I mean, things are starting to pick up. What do we know about underlying inflation in Japan at the moment? Um so the big wage negotiation will absolutely feed into um, higher wage growth um, and higher service prices, which we haven't seen seen it in macro data because which uh, the, the the agreement was just made, and I think it's going to be feed into a May and June data that will be due um, from July or August or whatsoever. But it's uh, we can expect that to happen, and also um, I, I would say the higher energy prices, not because of the kind of demand or whatsoever, but because of the uh, uh, subsidy cut, will uh, support the core CPI uh, going on this year. And the CPI will comfortably uh, um, hover over BOJ's 2% target. That will um, give uh, leeway for the Bank of Japan to uh, do policy normalization, including Mm. hiking rates and, and QT. Yeah, you draw some uh, attention to uh, normalization and the fact that, uh, you know, sometimes the market wants normalization, sometimes it wants the right policy for what's happening in the economy. So, for instance, if the BOJ normalizes and raises interest rates into an economy that is troubled, is not really growing, uh, then the market could react badly. Uh, but it seems like what you're saying is um, the, 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 the moves are there or the conditions are there for things to improve going forward, and the BOJ probably will act, just not in a huge way. Right. So I, I, my, my expectation is BOJ will raise rates up to 0.5 uh, by October. So it's going to be uh, 40 basis points from current uh, 0.1 um, um, a policy target upper bound. I, I don't think 0.4, like 4, 40 basis point rate hike won't wreak havoc to Japan's economy because um, it's 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 a, an aging um, economy. So the the uh, the size of the housing construction or housing purchases is just three percent in the whole economy, and also uh, the balance sheet of Japanese corporates are getting healthy. So the limited amount increase in rate in, rates increase won't wreak havoc on their profits as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Taro Kimura, Senior Japan Economist at Bloomberg Economics. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.